So welcome everyone to our meet and greet with our new and highly anticipated um, associate, senior associate dean of student, of student, academic and student affairs. What a mouthful. Otherwise known as our chief academic officer, our provost, and, and most importantly, um, just a really incredible human being who you're going to learn a lot about and from this evening. I am Lynn Roberts. I think I know most, if not all of you, and I am the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Alumni Relations here at the CUNY School of Public Health. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you to give the official welcome on behalf of the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy this evening, our illustrious Dean, Ayman El Mahandes. Good evening, everybody, and a hearty welcome from your Dean. It is a tremendous pleasure for me to invite you and congratulate you on this wonderful decision you have made for yourselves and for your future careers. Public health is a worthy uh, career and an important contribution to society and human well-being. The fact that you chose public health as a career option tells me a lot about you. So welcome to this family uh, of interdisciplinary learning. We have mathematicians, we have social scientists and behavioral scientists, we have policy analysts, we have environmental health specialists and nutritionists, we have geo geographical uh, specialists in geosciences. We are a wonderful family of interdisciplinary learners, including communications, global health, uh, informatics, a very wide array of disciplines that you have chosen uh, to select as part of this public health learning uh, society, this public health learning community. You've also chosen to join a public school of public health. And there's a tremendous characterization of what a public school of public health means. It means that you are privileged in belonging to a school that is supported by the taxpayer of New York City. That is a tremendous privilege. Number one, because your faculty are fully covered by an annual uh, salary that allows them to focus on teaching and learning, but also allows them to be selective in their research endeavors in ways that are most impactful and meaningful to society and to New York residents at large. But it also means that uh, we uh, are more affordable than private schools only because the public is supportive of you, of your learning endeavors, and of this university. I, as a dean, will tell you that the faculty that we have and the administration that we have is fully committed to your success. And we have created an environment of learning that hopefully you will find most conducive to your uh, future careers uh, and your future success. An example is our Career Skills Academy, for example, which adds at no cost to you a lot of opportunity to hone in your competencies and your skills to become public health professionals. I'm already proud of you, but I will tell you, now I go to places far and wide and meet alumni from the school who are performing at the highest level and making CUNY School of Public Health proud. It is not by coincidence that our school, only six years old, has been ranked number 15 out of 235 schools and programs around the country. Need I tell you that as the public school of public health, we are the number one public school of public health in the tri-state area, 
And in the entirety of the East Coast, we are only second to the University of North Carolina. We are very, very proud of our achievements. We are very, very proud of our faculty. And we are very, very proud of you. My doors are always open. My email is such an easy email that you can use any time to reach out to me. My email is simply dean, since I am the dean of the school, dean at sph.cuny.edu. If there's anything I can do to assist you, if there is any problem that you feel I can have influence in resolving, or if simply you want to communicate with me, please feel free to do so. That is one of the great things about our school is access to our faculty and our administration. We are committed in our mission to social justice and equity, and that is at the core of what we do and how we do it. If you remember, our, our school's name is the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And therefore, uh, you should not be surprised that the, the second person in that school to myself, the Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, is a health policy person that complements uh, my expertise as a Dean in public health. And therefore, you will find that both your interest in public health and health policy will, regard, will be regarded with the same degree of importance and interest. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Terry McGovern, who is my Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs. She uh, has a wonderful career uh, that where she stood by the underserved and ensured equity and social justice in health uh, amongst disenfranchised and isolated populations, be it amongst gays during the AIDS epidemic or uh, disenfranchised and underserved women looking for their reproductive rights and reproductive health justice. I'm very proud that uh, this partnership uh, between uh, Professor McGovern and the school will only bring out the best in our potential and will create future opportunities for you as students uh, in the most significant way. Again, I say welcome. I would have liked to be there in person, but I am recovering from the flu. So I'm trying to be public health and not be there to infect those around me. Uh, although that is uh, taking away from me the privilege of being with the new cohort joining our school. Welcome again, and remember, uh, my doors are always open to you, and I welcome you at any and all times. Professor McGovern, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean. I hope you're feeling better. Uh, always difficult to, to follow you, uh, but uh, I am so thrilled to be here. I, I actually began in uh, towards the end of July, and I have been waiting to meet the students. So uh, I'm really happy to see some of you today. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about my career because for any of you who feel nervous about what your direction might be, I'm here to say if somebody had said to me in law school that I would end up as a senior, whatever my title is here, I would have said, that's not possible. It's ridiculous, right? Um, so all of that to say, you kind of never know where life is going to take you. And that's kind of the beauty of life. But, um, you know, sometimes you just have to keep moving. And if you can't find what you want, you may need to try and create it. Uh, and my career is a little bit about that. Um, so I actually started as a poverty lawyer. I wanted to be a poverty lawyer in 1987 and just came back to New York City and was in a legal services office. And you might know from history that the HIV epidemic was hitting big time. Um, and I noticed immediately that there were predominantly women of color and mostly men of color who were living in public housing, who were coming in needing lawyers and faced every kind of discrimination you can imagine. Um, 
in the course of taking those cases and in particular not being able to get Medicaid or disability for women of color who were dying, you know, T cells are the marker of your immune system. And, you know, maybe a healthy person might have 12, 1200, 1400. These women were coming in with two T cells, so sick, so sick. And I would get, I would take their case, appeal it. And the decision would come back saying they exaggerated their pain. And in several cases, they died before the decision even came. So I decided to uh, work with a whole lot of people, including activists, to bring a lawsuit, uh, bring a class action. And in the course of that class action, we learned that they actually hadn't, in fact, had enough or any women in the trials, very few women of color. And the list of diseases that, that comprise the AIDS definition didn't take into account gynecological disease, converging epidemics, communities that were already overburdened with tuberculosis, pneumonia. So imagine we had to do a class action, which we won, and when we won it in 1994, the number of black women with HIV went up by 49%. Now think about that. So science is not objective. Uh, what evidence is, is not necessarily correct. Um, and, and these were the lessons that I learned. I could go on and on in every category. There was kind of, you know, this, you know, gay men with HIV had done amazing to get all these automatic, automatic eligibility, uh, you know, systems in place. But unfortunately, the definition was discriminatory of AIDS. So it really, it really was a long struggle. And and the, and 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 yet, in that struggle, the people who taught me were my women clients, my women of color clients who were the ones who were going out and saying, listen, forget about whatever anybody's saying, this is happening to us. Um, and they kind of took up the leadership of fighting for justice in this context. So the kinds of terms you hear here, community-based participatory research, leadership, they are so central to achieving public health, right? And, and sometimes actually, evidence isn't enough. You actually need advocacy and you need community organizing and you need leadership from communities. I, I don't think you can get anywhere without any of those things, but those lessons really define my career. So I did that. I was a lawyer for until 2000. And then I'll, I'll cut across, but started to do global work largely because uh, as we had a treatment breakthrough here, um, there was suddenly in 1995, a cocktail that would keep people with AIDS alive. Guess what? The rest of the world didn't have it because there had been a move by a lot of the pharmaceutical industries to extend patent protection right at the moment as we had that AIDS breakthrough. So I was put on President Clinton's AIDS Drug Development Task Force and there I began to do a lot of intellectual property around patents, which of course, all of this became super relevant in COVID, right? Um, who could afford what? Uh, who pays for what? Um, these are all policy issues that are really driven by, should be driven by evidence, but it doesn't really necessarily play out that the policies reflect the evidence. Um, so after many years of doing HIV and more broadly kind of justice, gender justice, I went to the Ford Foundation and worked in the Health and Human Rights Unit um, where I worked even more globally and was able to actually see that I could put resources in places that they had never been there and been before and it would really change things tremendously. So. I learned over and over again that access to power, which is affected by structural racism and sexism and all those things, it's really, really powerful and important to look at. Um, so um, I then, you know, after I was doing, uh, I was doing environmental justice and then I was doing intellectual property at the Ford Foundation, leadership change. They eliminated the programs I was working on. So I went back and I'm telling you all these little details because I want you to follow that 
things don't always go in the way that you expect. There's stops and starts as people are kind of fighting to, to as we try to straighten out some of the biggest drivers of poor health outcomes, right? Um, it's political. So it's, you know, it goes back and forth. So um, in any case, I then uh, went to Columbia to run the health and human rights program, became a chair there. Um, but all that time, I really wish that I had been here. <laughs> um, so the good news is that um, coming here now, late in my career, I'm here to actually just try to support and help and download as much as possible to you of what I've experienced. Um, you know, also to make sure that we are addressing not just environmental exposures in the science, but how do we change the land use processes, right? What do we do about the state of reproductive justice or injustice in this country? Um, there are amazing faculty through this school, like uh, like Dean Roberts, who I've known since you know 1912, not really, I mean 1980s, right? Um, there's such amazing people all throughout this school, and I think what we'll, we're going to be doing jointly is really thinking about how we have the best school possible for all of you, how we also. Um, maybe better infiltrate some of the policy making processes that really should have a lot more of an evidence base. Um, and I'm very, very excited to be doing that. Um, I, uh, so, you know, I have to just share that I worked many jobs through college and law school. Um, so I'm really happy to be in a place where all of you are so committed to these, to these issues that most of you are working doing this at night. Um, it's really very inspiring to me and also something that I know well. Um, so I'm just really, really thrilled to be here. Um, I uh, am also like, like the Dean and I know like Dean Roberts, I'm really thrilled to hear from you anytime. Um, I've been reaching out, trying to find, you know, it, it's hard in this environment to find students sometimes. <laughs> so feel free to come ask for an appointment because I seem to have many, many meetings. Um, but I'd love to talk to you, um, love to hear your ideas, uh, you know, and just love to meet you. Uh, and um, I guess uh, unless Dean Roberts would like me to talk about something else, I'll just open it up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So that's exactly what I wanted us to do next was to open the floor and have you introduce yourselves um, to, um, you know, Professor Senior Associate Dean McGovern and to let's get to know each other. Um, she'd like to know, you know, maybe share your name, your program, what what you do outside of the CUNY School of Public Health that that's, um, you know, certainly a part of what you're you're contributing towards and anything else you'd like to ask in terms of, you know, your vision for the school or things you'd like to um, bring to us um, as you've joined, um, you know, a cadre of folks doing incredible work. And now we're finding some cross synergies about, you know, your work and the work of those who, who have been here, some new faculty who've recently joined us. Um, and of course, the, 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 you know, the leadership of our, of our Dean. So the floor is open. Okay. Um, my name is Justine. I'm in my second year of my MPH program. I'm in the epi bio track. Um, I work here. I work at Columbia. I do a bunch of different research projects. I'm on the GC. Um, I was at the first GC meeting, so I have seen you before, but, um, yeah, nice to meet you. Um, my question is, so you came from Columbia and now you're, uh, wh why did you choose CUNY? Like what, what was, you've had, you have a, an academic experience obviously, so why here? Um, well, I actually went to a SUNY for college, so I had a big appreciation for public education. And frankly, no matter how much money I tried to raise to create scholarships, et cetera, the tuition at, at, at Columbia is 68,000 a year. Um, so that was one issue. I also, there were there was a lot of community anger about Columbia's gentrifying various neighborhoods. Um, 
I found it really difficult to continue to feel as inspired as I knew I would feel here. Um, so I was kind of always wanting to get back into the public system. Um, and so I finally did it. Thank you. Um, my name is Sixtus Onyechi. Um, my concentration is uh, community head. Obviously, um, when you were speaking, uh, personally, I am highly motivated in the sense that you talk about the time during the HIV, the AIDS, you know, era in the 1980s and, you know, 1990s. But what really um, touched me so much, which I would like you to share with us, is um, I really want to know what really motivated you um, at that moment of time. Because, first of all, we know the society we, li we live in, and also considering, gen you know, gender issues in the United States. So how do you get the courage at that moment? Also knowing that, that that kind of disease was something new, which everybody was like being, getting isolated. They don't want to do with people around that. So how were you, you know, get involved and get motivated in order to, you know, do you carry out the job and the works you did at the time? Yeah, it should be green. Just hold Hi. it close. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was that I, nobody else in my poverty law office, which would have been people who were supposedly committed to justice, nobody else would take the HIV cases because they were scared, right? Um, my, the receptionist was spraying Lysol after my clients would come into my office. Um, so what, I, what gave me the courage were the people's faces, like these women that I was seeing who were the loveliest, bravest, you know, remember that there was absolutely no indication that women would get this thing, right? Um, and so not just to talk about women, because there were tons of gay men of color in the projects and other places that were facing the same kind of, you know, different, but nobody had thought about that, right, in this epidemic. Um, people in prisons, another category. But frankly, what gave me the courage was how incredible these people were. They were so brave. They were so funny. They were so gutsy about what was happening, even though we were literally fighting to prove that they were dying of a disease, right? Um, so I just feel like if you can never lose sight of humans and how incredible they are, and 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 then you come face to face with this incredible injustice, right? Um, that's the motivating factor. And still, if I'm really nervous about something, if I have to go into a difficult setting, I always think about the people that I'm working with. Um, so that's why I always tell people, spend time in the community um, because you're going to be in rough spots where you're going to have to have courage and you need to carry them, right? So. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll ask. Okay. <laughs> so I, you know, as, as you said earlier, we've, our, our paths have crossed without us ever working together closely. And this is quite a moment for, 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 for the two of us to be in the same institution um, doing, you know, the work that we care a lot about. So I guess for me, it's not so much, you know, why CUNY, why now as, um, what would you really, what would be an exciting thing for you to accomplish while here? Um, thank you. Uh, I think uh, one thing is there's been this incredible maternal child health concentration. There's been Dean Roberts, but I would like to see a much broader kind of reproductive justice program that connects everything, connects environmental justice, connects obviously maternal mortality. Um, there's so much great work going on. Like I have learned about some of the research. So I would like to see a program that uh, is a little broader than the existing one um, that also has a really serious leadership component. This is one of my favorite topics is that we graduate, you folks, you're amazing. And then you're, you go into these environments where there's like a million microaggressions coming at you a day you're put in these positions where you have to decide, 
do I lose my situational power if I raise my concerns about what I'm seeing? I don't know of any program that takes those things on seriously. Um, and I would love to, to see that happen here. Um, so that's one area that really excites me. And then I think also taking a look at our global program, given that we are sitting here near the UN for what it's worth, um, we're at a moment where we're in some global trouble, needless to say, with climate change, with all the gender stuff. So um, I would really like to see, and I do know the global programs of NYU and Columbia, and I think CUNY students uh, have something unique to add to this whole picture and could really make a difference. So I'm interested in also, um, you know, kind of taking a look at that. And then one thing that I'll say is that I, it's funny, in all my jobs, I always felt like I was an outlier, maybe because I went to SUNY Albany or maybe just because of me and the work I've done. But I, once I got here, I realized how much access to power these institutions have. Um, so it's very exciting to me, the idea of being able to open up all those doors for, for all of you, because you're the ones who are actually going to be able to solve these problems that are out there. So that makes me feel joy, the idea of being able to do that. And it also makes me feel like maybe all that, those moments where were, that were difficult for me were worth it, because now I could teach about them. Thank you for that. So what are some of the things you you're working on yourselves and you know anyone? No. <laughs> Don't want to put anyone on the spot. We have a few staff people here or questions you have about the school in general that yeah. you think we could help with. Anything you'd like to see happen? I'd love to hear your thoughts. On this is the person to tell to tell it to. You have a you know real rich opportunity here. Hello, uh, my name is Valerie. Um, I'm in the community health uh, concentration. I'm in the second year of my MPH program. And I also serve as a senator, a master senator as part of uh, student government. And um, while talking to my peers, what has come up is um, their concern over uh, lack of opportunities to know about conferences or workshops or other opportunities that are available outside of our establishment. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions of how we um, could propose to, you know, bridge our students with um, outside opportunities. So it would be, you know, so I Immediately, I, I started when I got here, I heard about stuff going on at Ford Foundation. I passed it on to Hannah of the Office of uh, Experiential Learning. But I would love send me an email to tell me if, if, if you could tell me what are the best ways to get opportunities out to students. Since I was new, I went through the Office of, of Experiential Learning. But opportunities come all the time, and I'm really happy to share them. In fact, that's the whole point. Um, so it would be helpful if there are better for me to know if there are better ways to to kind of let you all know about things that are going on. But um, I think I would love that. So um, what I don't know yet is about all the different structures. Like I just signed up for Handshake, for example. I think the one um, way is actually through your um, our student government, um, in which Valerie um, serves as a senator. We just finalized the hiring of our communications officer, which took a little longer than we anticipated. I think we got the letter um, finalized today. So once um, that person is up and running, the newsletter is your source. One thing we have to always stress is how important it is for you to check your emails. I know you hear that from every office, but a lot of information does get shared but you can also contribute to the information that we share. So in the in your workplaces and who you interact with, feel free to, to send that to the GSGA at sph. Actually, it's at sphmail, just like your email addresses, um, dot cuny.edu. Dot because I know, um, you know we can share um, that through the newsletter. Um, sometimes it's been weekly. Sometimes it's been biweekly. 
Um, and it's really up to each GSGA um, to determine how, how frequently they can get that out. And then they're all the communications you get from, you know, from SPH every week, they're, every Wednesday, maybe if you just make a note, you'll get a, what's called the SPH update every Wednesday. And every Friday, you get the events roundup. So that's every week. And that's thanks to our um, Director of Communications, um, Samana Chandra. So they're, you know, they it's only as good as we collectively make that. Um, everyone is a part of this community and, and can contribute to, to, you know, what we share with one another. Um, I would like to see more moments like this. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think we'll ever have an ideal time of day or evening. So maybe we have to do more of them. Maybe they will be smaller until it, until at different times of the week, different times of the day, folks get to know each other outside of Zoom, <laughs> right? And those who are not able to be with us because they live, you know, beyond um, proximity to our campus, then we have to find maybe ways to do it remotely, but with people who are also in the same area, maybe they can hook up with each other locally and go out for an evening or meet somewhere else offline. There's no reason why we can't create those those possibilities. In the back of the room, we have James Warren. You probably have gotten communications from him. He's our student. He's your student life coordinator. OK, um, and he's here for you as as all of us are to ensure the best possible experience here as a student, eventually as an alum, um, and again, as part of the public health um, powerhouse that I think uniquely CUNY students contribute to, right? As, as um, Professor McGovern pointed out, CUNY students aren't like any other students in New York City, I'm sorry. And I've taught at these other institutions, both NYU and at Columbia, and I don't know how you did it as long as you did, because I, I did it just as a guest, you know, you know, lecturer from time to time. And every time I said, boy, there's something different. When I'm with my CUNY students, the conversations, the questions, the lived experience, it's unmatched. And I've, I even I've taught in California. I've taught in other parts of the country. I've, I've taught at graduate schools without walls, you know, <laughs> very progressive settings, and it's still different. I don't know what it is, if it's in the water, <laughs> if it's your parents, you know, what ha it doesn't matter. It's a unique uh, orientation to the world. Because just to, if you think about it, New York, so much happens here in New York. It's been touched by, you know, every public health crisis imaginable. Um, and yet um, people persist, they thrive. They, they have their humor and their creativity to thrive and, and all of that happens here. So I just hope to hear from more of you, um, find out ways where you can participate more. I also am an open door. I'm here on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm right on the fifth floor um, with James and other staff. Um, our registrar was here earlier. I know you've interacted with her and her office, uh, Molly Ghosh. Um, and so, you know, we are not, you know, we are not an ivory tower by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah, so I've I've heard uh, some discussion among students about it's difficult to find community here. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the structure of the school or because most students are in a two-year program, but even like niche community like for example I'm the acting president of the LGBTQ association I'm also currently the only member I think so we're having difficulty like creating you know senses of community even for um, marginalized groups of students here and I'm wondering if you have any input or um, suggestions on how to improve that sense that feeling I mean, I have a question back for you, which is, do you think if we did like small brown bag lunches or maybe you've done them right? Or if we on certain topics like LGBTQI issues, right? Do you think people would a attend in person or would it have to be hybrid? So one thing is to have small 
have smaller, not just grand rounds, right? Smaller discussions about topics that are of interest to students. I, I love those. So, so that's one idea. I just don't know, if, you know, the, I, I'm not used to this, like people not being here. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that is a good um, option, especially if it is offered in a hybrid format, mm -hmm. um, because it can be a lot to ask students to come to campus in, in addition to like their class loads. Um, and also just like getting participation can be difficult because everyone's doing so much. Um, but I do think like focusing on small topics is important um, or even like small policy changes. Like I noticed that there's not a lot of um, pronoun introductions when people introduce themselves or they're not included on Zoom calls, things like that to yeah. make it a safer space. Yeah. I mean, I think those, I think those are, that's really important. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we'll, we can definitely work on it for sure. Cause I love those types of things. Hi everyone. My name is Bayan. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a uh, part of the community health track. I'm also in the maternal child reproductive and sexual health track. And I'm also the acting president of the repro club that has kind of gone a little radio silent. So I, I echo you. Clubs are an especially challenging thing to navigate just because, A, we have incredibly busy lives and it is hard to um, establish a club that has momentum and, and works with everybody's availability. So something I would love to do is potentially have a club day where we can um, give these clubs a bit of a platform and and introduce them to people to because oftentimes people aren't even aware that we have these clubs. Um, I know speaking from the previous officers of the Repro Club, uh, the Repro Club took a big hit with COVID because it was challenging to navigate um, the club virtually. Um, so I would really love to give the clubs an opportunity to shine in the upcoming months. Great. That's a great idea. Okay. I, I know we're really restrained by not having the campus open when we're not in class, right? right. Like on Fridays. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a great idea. And I, you know, we can, we can do that for sure. I'm glad to hear about these clubs. Thank you for those who just joined us. This is an open forum for just, you know, asking questions, sharing your thoughts, ideas, suggestions for the school. Anyone in the back, if you want to offer anything, you can let us know. But I know you just got in and walked in and you're like, oh, where am I? Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, um, this is our, our new provost, Terry McGovern, and, and I'm Lynn Roberts, the uh, associate dean of, of, what am I? <laughs> associate dean of student affairs and alumni relations. Sorry, I'm definitely in this just walked in and I don't know it's already been talked about. So forgive me if somebody already brought this up, but um, many CUNY campuses have child care centers or resources for parents with young children. As far as I know, this one doesn't. And I would love to see like some sort of feasibility of ways that we could support parents of children um, who are students here. So thank right. you for that. That's yeah, I don't know. It's definitely on our, our list of things we would like what we can do. And this is something that came about only recently within CUNY is to connect you with the child care services that are provided through CUNY on other campuses. And it might be that they're closer to where you live, not to our campus. But as a smaller school, it's just not feasible for us to provide it directly. But in terms of, uh, you know, access to where those are provided, I think the main one is in Queens at Queens College. Again, it's so unique to um, where you live, perhaps, or where you work, and not only where you come to school. And what I what I can do is um, there is a coordinator for CUNY who can also make referrals. So it could be that that's what you may not be aware of. I, James stepped out, but he goes to a monthly meeting of resource centers throughout CUNY that includes, you know, campuses that have more of these services because they have larger student bodies. Um, these are the mostly the four-year colleges um, and many of them can offer more than we can offer. And so we're constantly trying to 
figure out how we can do some partnerships with some of the other campuses to make sure that our um, students can access what's available. One thing I know we can is through um, is the help, is the food pantries because we have referred students to them. The child care is a newer um, push within CUNY to be a little more coordinated across campuses. So thank you for that. And and you may be aware that a parent support group was started recently um, by our wellness program. Yes, and they actually meet on Thursdays. <laughs> um, and um, Sherry Adams, who is our director of counseling and wellness, um, we have a um, one of the other staff facilitates that and it was at the request of our students, particularly our doctoral students. And so um, that started for the first time this semester. We, we tend to respond to what students ask us to provide in terms of that type of support. But I imagine within those groups, there could be also opportunities to share resources and ideas um, that could be helpful in terms of actual child care. I don't know if people are aware we have a um, a room for um, those who are breastfeeding or chest feeding up on the eighth floor. And it's, you know, always there when you come to campus, you just have to um, make sure that public safety will unlock the door for privacy. We, we can't just have you go to the room, um, unfortunately, because someone could be in there and using it. For those who just joined again, we're the floor is open to ask any questions of, of hi, Professor everybody. McGovern. Hi, everybody who just came. <laughs> I'm Terry. I um, guess I can't get up from the seat, huh? Yes, you can. Oh, you thank can God. I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> felt constrained. No, it's all right. Um, so last week there was actually a man out front of um of our building thrown on the floor. Um, it could have been an opioid overdose. Um, and I realized that our staff is not trained, um, downstairs in the lobby. They don't have Narcon. Um, they're not Narcon trained. And I think that that's something really important that everybody here in this, as the school of public health should be at least offered the training and all security personnel should, um, carry Narcon on them and be trained to do so. It's like a one minute training. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about how people are trained, but it sounds like we a actually good idea. have done it um, okay. prior to COVID uh, when we had more people on campus. It was done right here in this room. It was open to staff, students, and faculty, um, and we coordinated that. So we can certainly do it again. The folks that are downstairs in the lobby are not our employees. They it, we rent space, so we don't have any control over their staff training. We have had meetings though, um, and we have um, folks who are part of the Harlem Health Initiative here, led by Deborah Levine, who has a strong relationship in the community. And you might not be aware that that program even exists, but um, we, we are very open to bringing in folks to do not only Narcan, but other trainings and opportunities to make us more responsive to the needs of the surrounding community. Um, so thank you for that uh, reminder and suggestion. But then, at, in fact, the NARCAM was done, it was initiated by students, um, some who are, and we have an alum who is very involved and has, who can come and do the training for us. So thank you for that. That's real easy to do. And we could do it both, you know, remotely and um, um, in person. Hi, uh, my name is Bisma. I'm in the community health concentration. And um, earlier you were mentioning something about expanding on um, global health in CUNY SPH. And I was wondering, because I'm very much interested in that, I was wondering on how you would go on about and do that. Is it through a student organization? Like, could we form like a club on that? We could. I, I I mean, you know, so step one, I just got here, right? So what I what I was doing is actually looking at all the courses that are global courses and looking at the core and trying to figure out what's exists now, right? And then kind of the next step would be kind of going out there and figuring out what people want and what students want is critical to that, right? Because we, you know, some some there's a 
some people will say, well, there wouldn't be a big student interest in a global MPH, right? So students are critical to kind of what, where, what we should be doing in the global space for sure. So I don't know, I'm, I'm too new yet to even know. I just heard about two clubs today, but um, there's a bunch of things. We could hold a special meeting where people could come in and talk about what they think should be in the curriculum, what we should be doing. Um, Cause I think it's pretty open. What is clear is that CUNY because of who you all are, we could really have a very different type of global program than the ones that exist. And that's hugely exciting. Um, so I would love to, to hear from you and, and other students that are interested. And uh, maybe the best thing to do is to just have an open forum one day. Um, where where you come and talk about what you think should be here. I agree with you. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And one more thing I wanted to add on. I was just hearing everyone. I agree that there should be like um, small group discussions on smaller topics. And I was also going to suggest if we can have like, uh, like, I guess, little mini support groups throughout the semester a year on certain topics that students have a combined interest in um even if it's something in regards to like i don't i don't know like if students are stressed out in the semester and it's like mental health or something so they could have like small support groups and students who are interested can join and discuss something like that i was going to say on that last note we actually already have that so we have the two support groups that are currently running one is again as i said for parents and the other one is for stress management as students. So again, go to our counseling and wellness site and, and we'll make sure that you know that this, these things are posted um, in the lounges, on the monitors, in the emails that get sent out, but I know you get a lot of emails. So tell us how we can better inform you of these things, because if you don't know about that, that's our problem, right? Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I'm aware of those two groups. I just wanted to say, like, if there are other topics or any other things that students want to form a support group on so they, we can have, like, more like that. I mean, and, and, and it sounds like you mean more peer-led. Okay. Absolutely. And those are things to bring to the attention of your student government and see how they can facilitate that. There's a room dedicated to the Graduate Student Government Association on the fifth floor. It belongs to the GSGA. If you wanna meet, you contact them and say, we'd like this, this space on such and such a time on what, Monday, Wednesday through Thursday, right? And make it happen. Okay. I'm going to comment on your idea um, and ask a question, but also want to comment on what you said, and I agree. I do think that having a more global um, public health curriculum in a global context would be a lot better to reflect the the people that are actually in our classroom. Because in our room, we have a bunch of students who are international, and a lot of the core, a lot of the curriculum we talk, we touched on is basically like local, like state based and mostly USA-based. There's not a lot of room to bring in an international like, point of view in our curriculum or in our classes. And it also gives us a, a, like a wider range of just how to focus on more generalized in this country and more about how we can apply to other in the world. As public health students, it's also important to keep that in mind, just not staying so narrow-minded on one region, but how our programs or <laughs> intervention could hopefully implement, be implemented in other parts of. But then my question in regards to training was what are, I guess, the grounds of having mandated training for all students, not just like an optional course that someone can just go to, but making it a requirement for everyone to have Narcan training. Is that like a possibility to make it mandated, mandatory? I mean, I, I, it, there, there would have to be a process and a demand. Right, so the process might be through the University Student Senate um, of CUNY, and it might be the the governor, right? Yeah, I mean, there's ways that you can mobilize. Students make things happen, believe it or not. It's, you know, they've ended wars, <laughs> right? Students, any movement I've been a part of, 
has been largely driven by younger people, right? With support of some old heads too, right? I remember when I was a younger person, but now that I'm an older person, I, you know, I, I mobilize with young people. So, um, but I, you know, that might be a process that might take more time than than the immediacy of now. So I think in the meantime, it's good to do the things that um, we can do, and and still strive for those things that may seem a little farther afield. Um, I think definitely like having it mandated would probably not be the way to go. But I mean, we are at School of Public Health. So wouldn't it be kind of fun to make like a little intervention to see how many people we can actually sign up for uh, Narcon training? Um, but the other but the something more simple I want to get at is I don't understand how I nobody can tell me what's on each floor. Like I learned that we only have five floors here. I don't know anything here i asked the guard hey what's on this floor mm -hmm. you know um why ha didn't i get any information like when i signed up for school about like like you said getting involved in the government uh student government i don't have that information um and once again very public health thing being informed you know it's hard to do things and take action when you're not informed um so i mean it would be nice to have like a little handbook or something so well, I am mindful of the time. Um, we are past six o'clock, but I did want to give maybe Terry any last thoughts you want to share as folks are trying to get to class too. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> just thank you and just email me. I, I really am happy to, I, I'm going to set up that global thing very quickly. So whatever we call it, I have to like also learn all the rules and I admit I don't know what's on each floor either. So <laughs> I need the handbook as well. Um, yeah. So me being new really makes me understand what, how difficult some of this is. So um, I thank you and look forward to working much more closely with you. Um, so please do be in touch. Th and yes. thank you. Thank um, you. And thank you. Um, Aisha and Danielle or DJ. Um, thank you. We will be uh, sharing what you've shared with us um, with others to make as much of this happen.